Lily's SD here and it's a Saturday night, which means that I'm on call at the hospital. So I'm just sitting here with my badge, with my phone, with my water bottle, with my tarot cards, <laughs> and now with you. So I wanted to talk today about the suit of wands. Um, we've been working through the Drop'em 78 challenge. Um, we've worked through the suit of pentacles, ace through king, and now we're We've just completed yesterday the suit of wands, ace through king, and we are diving into the cups today with the ace of cups. But I wanted to talk about the wands um, and to share some of the things that I've discovered and have been thinking about um, as I've been working through, through this suit. The mm, deck that I've been focusing on is the Melissa Weatherspoon's Lonely Dreamer Tarot, which uses the artwork of the late 19th, early 20th century artist Odilon Redon, uh, a precursor to French surrealism, uh, whose artwork is just, it's, it's magical, it's just dreamy, moody, lonely. Um, it's so powerful. Lots and lots of angels, lots of kind of bent, nude figures, lots of imagery of vulnerability uh, and sadness and um, lots of horses. It's, it's an amazing, uh, his repertory is just amazing. And Melissa uses his imagery beautifully, uh, editing cards very gently with a really firm eye for uh, where and how to add just that right detail, that suit element to make the cards connection to the traditional Waitsmith imagery clear. It's really an interesting deck. So that's the deck I've been focusing on. Um, and I've been using what I call a calibration deck. A lot of people doing the challenge have been doing this, where I've been using a deck whose imagery is clearer to me, a deck that can serve as a kind of control or a reference that can help ground me in my work. Um, so for some people, that's been a deck that they know extremely well. For others, like me, it's a deck that I don't necessarily know extremely well because it's a deck that's somewhat new to me. Um, but it's a deck whose tradition really is clear to me and helps clarify things. So the deck I'm using for my calibration is um, Kristen Condor and William Raiders. They're the geniuses behind Artisan Tarot. Their restoration of the 1701 uh, Jean Dodal tarot deck. Um, so this is, here's the one of the title cards from that deck, the two of pentacles, or two of discs, two of coins, two of deniers. Um, so this particular deck is relatively new to me, but it's a tarot de Marseille deck, and that's very familiar to me. And it's a really great calibration deck because it helps me say some very, very clear things about each of the suits, particularly the, the minor arcana suits and the way that they relate to uh, the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. So let's talk about, let's talk about the suit of, of wands or batons in the Marseille tradition. And let me, let me show you what I mean by, by how this deck is helping me calibrate. So one of the things that becomes clear in the Tale de Marseille in the attribution of uh, this suit to what we would say the suit of fire. One of the things that becomes clear is that this, the, the suit of wands or batons is a suit that's all about vitality. It's about the way in which life uh, is at once the source of power, like the fuel for power and the, the use of that power. So what do I mean by that? I mean very simply, you know, if you've got a living branch uh, as your emblem for the suit in its in its ace form in its in its pure potential form that branch is wood wood is what burns right um, this is a, a piece of living wood we can tell it's it's living because there seems to be a, a a leaf growing out of it but it's also been cut it's been severed so it's now firewood as well it's both green and living and it's also ready to burst into flames and those flames are spurting off of it in all directions in these little sort of semen like they also look like the the Hebrew letter yud the the little y letter um, 
uh, in these little emanations, right? And the, the cut edges of this, uh, of this living branch, which is also now firewood, the cut edges look like little spurts of flame, right? So the very core suit element is at once wood and fire. It's at once uh, that which grows and that which burns, right? It's at once the, the cause and the effect of energy, right? That energy that, that enables something to set a flame, right? This is this cool thing about the batons. They are uh, vitality itself. I remember um, something L, uh, uh, we haven't heard from L for a long time, but L at Sacred Seed, she was a YouTuber who posted, I don't know, maybe six years ago. Uh, we haven't heard from her in a long time, but I remember her talking about the ways in which the baton is narrower at the bottom and then gets wider at the top and how that's like the movement of Kundalini of that coiled serpent energy that's at the base of, of each of our spines. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the vitality of the suit of wands. And then this is this other thing that the Tarot de Marseille tradition helps make clear. When we get into uh, the deuce through, through 10, each of the batons now is a straight line. And this suit makes clear the ways in which the encounter um, of one suit element with the next it makes us see how that's about a meeting it's it's an encounter right it's x marks the spot um, the force of us hitting the world of us meeting the world very different from what the swords do right the swords cut through uh, and we'll talk more when we get to the sword suit uh, in a few weeks but the the swords cut through they have two edges um, they, because in the Terre de Marseille, they're scimitars, they often embrace, right? They, in their encounter, they intersect and embrace, they create a centerpiece, but uh, the, the swords also show us European broadswords in the odd-numbered cards, and those have double edges and are straight and pierce through. Swords are a fascinating suit. Do you see how I mean, though, that like the imagery of the Tao de Marseille, it's, it's really, it's something that's very crisp for me, very clear for me. And it, it has taught me so much about each of the minor arcana suits. And it, it teaches me that the wands are the suit of, of this kind of vitality, uh, both the cause and the effect of life, of the vital, of energy, and that it's the suit of a kind of... Uh, Mm, kind of, uh, what do I want to say, uh, forceful, vibrant, vivid encounter. So in the even cards, we see how that encounter creates uh, a central point. It creates an intersection. And in the odd cards, we see how the singular, um, uh, the singular uh, wand, uh, I was going to say pierce through, but it doesn't pierce through. It stands through the middle. Um, and as we uh, increase in number, that middle area gets more and more complex until it ends up as um, this complex web, like this is the eight. You end up with this, with this centerpiece that has a great deal of complexity in it. So as the wands meet each other, as that vitality gathers and gathers and gathers, we end up with this, this um, strong net or webbing at the center. Um, and so the wands are very much a suit that is about um, uh, meeting and encounter and the interweaving of energy that happens as uh, we stride forth and respond to the world. So that's what I get from looking at the progression of these cards in the Tao de Marseille. That's, that's how this the Terre de Marseille helps me out with its, uh, with its calibration for my work with the Lonely Dreamer deck. In the Lonely Dreamer deck, what I've been most struck by is the way in which, okay, momentarily uh, interrupted by a phone call, but I'm back. So I was saying that, you know, what I've been most struck by in the Lonely Dreamer deck is the, 
given its name, the loneliness of the movement of vitality in the wands. And I think this is, this is the central message of, you know, I, I always see things in terms of what they're teaching us. And the tarot for me is, is, you know, teaching us how to live fuller and more abundant lives. It's teaching us, this is, you know, this is the Dharma teacher in me saying this. It's teaching us how to overcome our greed, hatred, and delusion, the three poisons that um, the Buddhist sages talk about. It's, it teaches us how to overcome. Overcome is not quite the right word because it's not like we get past greed, hatred, and delusion. We, we actually really become intimate with our own grasping and our own pushing away and our own self-forgetting. We, 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 we remember who we are. <laughs> we are beings who forget. <laughs> And we remember that fact about ourselves. And so the, the, the lesson from a mindful tarot perspective, from a, a Buddhist or Zen tarot perspective of the wands, is that we think that this incredible vitality that is at once, at once the cause of that which burns and the burning itself, we think that that vitality is ours. We, we lay claim to this. We were like, okay, this is, this is me. This is my upright... This is my upright self meeting the world, right? This is me. This is my force. I'm the one who can cut through uh, the, the branches of life and release the, the, the precious vital liquid. That's me. And in fact, life is living through us. It's not us at all. Well, no, I shouldn't say it's not us at all. It's not ours. <laughs> my vitality is not a resource that I possess. My vitality is life expressing itself as me. Does that make sense? My vitality is not a resource that I possess. My vitality is life expressing itself as me. So in The Lonely Dreamer, that truth about vitality, about the fire of wands, the fire of life, that truth um, emerges in the loneliness that the suit expresses. You know, so the kind of uh, quietness that we see in this ace, which is actually, it's interesting because it's not a singular ace of wands. We have a stand of trees here, although this, this uh, upright, uh, leafless trunk uh, this this branch this is this is what will recur throughout as the kind of prime emblem of the suit it, it is what gets collaged into each of the cards um, so you know the two the three I mean this three of wands you know the three of wands is so much the card um, so much the card of really committing ourselves to the encounter with the world if that two represents self meets world the three is like and goes for it. <laughs> the self goes into the world. You know, the classic idea in the Waitsmith imagery of the Three of Wands as, you know, standing on the shore waiting for my ships to, to come back in, right? You know, I've cast my, my energies, I've committed myself to the world, and now the world will, I'm waiting for the world to offer its, its return. This is a, a card that's about commitment and, and encounter and endeavor, like, committing ourselves to a task, going through the, the portal that the universe has provided and now realizing something. Um, but look how lonely and, and downcast that figure is. And then the Four of Wands, which is you know, classically a suit about the kind of commitment um, that a marriage might be, uh, the, the way in which that encountering with the world forms a stability, forms the stability of home of the four walls of a home, of the four poles of a chuppah, of a marriage canopy. Um, we have the ship imagery here too, and there's a, you can barely, can barely make it out. I'm having a hard time seeing it, even though I know it's there, but there's a couple that are on the, the ship. Um, um, and then this uh, ancestor, the way Melissa describes it in the guidebook is this is an ancestor looking on and the kind of an angel blessing the, the marriage. So it sort of echoes that imagery from the Waitsmith uh, depiction of, of the lovers in the major arcana with an angel blessing the union. Um, but what I'm struck by is that, you know, the union itself, it's at sea and it's small, 
the forces of the cosmos are so big, they're so powerful, they're beautiful, but there's a way in which um, this card brings forth the kind of uh, smallness of the human endeavor. And then the Six of Wands, you know, the card that's about the returning, conquering hero who here has this wreath. Um, so the sense that, you know, I've gone forth in the world with my energy, I've met the world, and now the world is offering me recognition in return. Um, you know, there is the kind of the faceless uh, onlookers, the audience, and the vulnerability of the central hero who's displayed in this beautiful way. He's almost become like, like a tree himself. Um, and again, a kind of movement in this suit of encounter and self and vitality, a movement toward um, vulnerability, a movement that reveals our vulnerability. And then Seven of Wands. You know, Seven of Wands is for me like one of my all-time favorite cards in the tarot. It's a card that I associate with the role of the Bodhisattva in Buddhism, that being of awakening, which is all of us because we're all awakened beings, even if we don't know it, especially because we don't know it. Um, and that sense that, you know, everything I do, I, I, even if I don't know it, I'm doing it for the whole world because I'm not in this alone. And that that recognition that I'm not in this alone can, can inform a heroic stance, not the heroism of the Six of Wands, that recognition and that, you know, I'm crowned with the laurel wreath, I've come back from victorious from battle, but the heroism of the person who stands and meets the world, meets whatever the world brings forth because, um, because how can I not meet the world, right? I love how this image invokes or evokes the image of a, of a matador, of a bullfighter with this kind of, uh, that, 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 at least what I get from this card is a sense of that bullfighter stance with a cape, this kind of shadow behind him, um, and a, uh, you know, the spear with which to, to pierce the bull. There's something of a, a sense for me of a living dance, a dance in relationship to that which seems to be in opposition, but be precisely because this is a dance, this isn't a true opposition, it's a partnership. And I love that this deck uh, can give us a sense of the seven of wands, of that I stand fast against the world, can give us a sense of this card as not just opposition, but as dance, as partnership, as something beautiful and alive. The same partnership that we see between the horse and his rider and all the horses in the Lonely Dreamer deck, all of those horses of Odilon Adon, they all carry that sense of partnership. And, and most precisely uh, in, I don't think there's any in, in the suit of wands, but he has a lot of images of centaurs. So images of horses that are also riders, right? Part man, part horse. The eight of wands, uh, this sense of speed. Uh, it took me a while to realize that this horse itself has is winged, right? The speed that comes with the Eight of Wands, the, 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 the rapidity or the, the um, vivacity that we associate with the Eight of Wands, with those Eight Wands hurtling, the swiftness with those Eight Wands hurtling toward the earth, um, this is just the vitality of the suit itself, right? Uh, being expressed uh, in some ways in its purest, in its purest um, uh, emanation. And I love here that, you know, it's not just um, that I'm moving forward, uh, it's that the, the horse that I'm riding is, is flying forward too. It's just a beautiful card. I mean, the, the colors alone, just extraordinary. And then, ah, one of my favorite cards in this deck, this Nine of Wands, which, is taken from uh, Redon's painting about Saint Sebastian, this, this twice martyred saint. So first he was uh, tied to a tree and shot through with arrows. Um, he was uh, subjected to the technical term for that is sagitation. 
like Sagittarius, Sagittation. So he's pierced through with arrows. You can sort of see some of the arrows. Um, they're like the, the, they're very lightly drawn like the spear in the Seven of Wands, those arrows. But he didn't die uh, after being stuck through with arrows. He went on to live and it wasn't until he was beaten to death that he died. So this idea of St. Sebastian as a martyr twice over, you know, like that, I mean, this really takes it to the imagery of the Nine of Wands, of that, that vigor and endurance, that persistence of vitality. It's like, nope, you can't kill me, you know? We just, that, that continuing to stand forth. And yet, you know, the Nines, my talisman for today is the Nine of Swords in the Charm Cast Tarot, that the nines are always where the energy of a minor arcana suit is, is most internal, is sort of taken up by the self, like it belongs to the self. So the nine of swords, you know, the nightmare card, because it's like all of that intensity of mind is stuck in my head. All of the swords are, are piercing the head of the, of the figure. In the nine of wands, it's like the, that vitality, that aliveness, that kundalini uh, of the suit, the self is trying to hold it all. And where does that ultimately go? It goes to oppression. You know, if I try to hold all vitality as if it is mine, as if it is in me, it will break me. And when I was talking before about how that um, sense of the uh, uh, Tarot de Marseille's vision of the wands, how that intersection of the batons all meeting, how it gets more and more complex at the center. If we look at what happens in the 10, if I can find it, hold on, it's a coming, I'll get it. So, you know, here it is uh, when we get to the 10, and of course tens are themselves, uh, those Roman numerals express the very principle of the batons that that turning point that happens in the 10 in tarot is a very wandsy turning point because it's all about how I turn my world and how my world turns me. By the time we get to the 10 of wands, right, that sense of meeting my world and, and imagining that vitality is mine now becomes this kind of impenetrable, like, a, like, the, like the portcullis in a castle, this impenetrable grate at the very heart of things. Uh, and I always see this, you know, as um, the way in which the ten is depicted here as eight wands or batons um, crossing each other to form that X and then two upright. I always picture this as, you know, that the, the sense of a, of a meeting and the enabling quality of that X marks the spot that we see in the two has now become kind of made rigid and there's no there's no real meeting that can happen we just have this this portcullis like like great at the center at the heart of things at the very heart of this encounter we've got kind of a impenetrable uh, diamond mess right um, it does not end well for the self this does not uh, holding vot vitality as mine does not end well. And then we get our beautiful court cards. We've got earth of fire, fire of fire, water of fire, and, and air of fire. I just wanna say a few words about the king, right? And the ways in which that figure of kingship stands so, a baby was just born. Yeah, a baby's born, and yet the king stands alone. I think the fact that his um, his face is so dark in this in this suit. I always think of the King of Wands as as the Sun King. You know, this sort of what it means to be heir of fire uh, is to be. Um, a fire that fills the air, that, that illuminates without burning. It's the sun, and you don't get to stand too close to the sun. 
So, you know, the wands points us toward a kind of strength and heroism and leadership, which is quite alone, uh, which uh, is in many ways tragic. So that's the wands, the story of the wands, you know, what it means to try to uh, claim vitality and aliveness, the fire of life, as if it is ours, as opposed to realizing that we are the expression of that vitality, that life is living through us, right? Life is living through us. I think this is something that the, the court cards uh, play out to some degree, and ultimately the court card that seems most um, flexible, most, uh, what's the word I want, most fluid with the teaching of the wands is the queen of wands, who is, right, water of fire in that kind of doubling of the court cards where they relate to the element of the suit and they also re relate to an element associated with their rank. So water of fire. I think it's in her that we see how um, what, it, what it could be like to really let the vitality of life flow through you. So people think about the Queen of Wands as like, you know, the eminently sexy, you know, that she's, she's a hot, <laughs> she's one hot number, <laughs> that Queen of Wands. Just look at her pussy, right? Um, sorry, I had to go there. But I think what's really true about the Queen of Wands is that she's the only member of the court that recognizes that this vitality uh, isn't hers, it flows through her. And that's what makes her such a powerful figure and such a, um, mm, such a source of warmth and strength for all those around her. Okay, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. Thank you guys, thank you so much for watching. As always, thank you for your practice. And if you haven't joined the Mindful Terror community yet, please consider doing so. It doesn't cost anything, it just means community. So we have a Facebook page where people are doing this Drop Em 78 challenge. You can either join in, you don't have to start at the beginning, you can dive in. We're, we're starting with the cups. What a wonderful suit to dive into. Dive into the water, the water's fine, the water of the cups. Um, but you can also uh, just, you know, check out what other people are posting. It's a really lovely group of people, really lovely, lovely, heartfelt, brilliant, generous crowd. And once a month we meet on Zoom uh, for, you know, I offer some teaching and there's lots of camaraderie and sharing and questions and we play cards, we sling some cards. And we are meeting next Sunday, November 20th, a week from tomorrow, depending on when you see this. But we meet always on the third Sunday of the month. And if you're interested, just drop me an email. Email address is below or join us on our Facebook page. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, all the best to you. Take good care. Toodaloo.